So let's go ahead and rise. We're going to start sitting. So find your sits bones. Sit in your chair well. All that means is you want to have your feet on the floor or otherwise ground to the earth. And you might roll back, <clears throat> excuse me, onto your tailbone just to see what that feels like. Roll forward a little too far and then go smaller and smaller until you find stable sits bone sitting. Engage your abdomen, but gently. Bring your shoulders, heavy bones, over your hips, also heavy bones. And we want to tuck our chin. That's the instruction, but it's not like this. It's really bringing our head back a tiny bit. We want the crown to always be pointing upward to the sky, to heavenly yang chi. Our feet can pull in yin chi from the earth, our crown yang chi from above us. This is going to be a little more pronounced when we're standing, but even when we're sitting, now that we've made this posture, this structure, our heart can be a little too far forward. So let's connect with our heart, inhale into it. And as you exhale, feel it sinking into the center of your body, the center of your chest. So we're not doing Kung Fu, we're not going to hollow out our chest, but we do want our heart to be centered. Let's do that a couple more times. Inhale, exhale, sink your heart gently. And just stay there. Let your body connect with, imprint, allow that posture to settle in. We want that posture to become kind of a default, especially when we're practicing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit to give some background and kind of an overview of what's involved in this Tao body or Tao body uh, curriculum I've pulled together. And mainly, we want to strengthen ourselves. But from a Taoist point of view, that means strengthening all of our bodies, not just our muscles not even just our physical body. And this metaphor, which us practitioners really don't take as a metaphor, but you can also get a lot of use out of it just in a theoretical way, is that we have multiple bodies. Us Westerners, we know our physical body. We can pat it, we can feel it, we know it because it's materially present. But in Qigong, we also have an energy body, an entire body of life force energy. That's what the acupuncturist accesses when they are needling you in a treatment. That's what the Tui Na person uses when they are pushing and pulling on your tissues and you're, they're actually working with your meridians. And uh, the word in Japanese for the point is tsubo, but we have this the whole body kind of saturated in life force. We have pathways, meridians, and we have points. I'll circle back to that later. Then we have the mental emotional body. And this one I think is usually new for us Westerners, the idea that our entire body feels emotion, that it is effect, uh, affected by the thoughts and beliefs that we hold. And uh, we won't be working too deeply with the mental emotional body this time. We, we did that more last time when we work with the organs and the six healing sounds. 
And uh, the next two bodies are the spirit body and the soul body. Or you can reverse those if you want. The, I'm speaking English. The words originally was Chinese. But what the important thing to note is one of them is very similar to the Western idea of a soul. It belongs to us. You know, it is the non-material part of us. And the other one doesn't entirely belong to us. It's almost uh, the image that makes the most sense to me is I have a bath of clear water and I drop paint into it or ink. That little cloud of color will look like it's different from the water around it for a while. It's not. And eventually the ink will dissipate and become indistinguishable from the bath. And that's sort of the Taoist spirit, let's call it the spirit. But it's ours for a little while, but it's really our little spot in the ocean of aliveness in the universe. One of the th reasons we pay attention to this, that it's not just philosophizing, is a lot of our chronic aches and pains and dysfunctions and imbalances that we can't move through physical body, exercise, uh, physical therapy, or medications can be moved through the mental emotional body or the chi body. And many people, I think many on this Zoom call will have experienced going to an acupuncturist and receiving relief from something you couldn't get elsewhere. Uh, the example for the mental emotional body for me is stress. You, you can have a headache from stress. You can have a chronic pain in your back from stress. Stress is just the mental emotional body in a state of imbalance for some reason, for one of many, many reasons, actually. And if we can move that stress, that headache can go away, the chronic pain can find relief. Of course, it's not true of all chronic pain, but you get my point. So generally, in Qigong, we think of the body as being made up of different materials, and we have different practices and approaches to strengthening or healing each of the different materials. The skin, obvious material, but it also, the skin extends outside our body. They call it the Wei Qi field. Um, I think some Western energetics will talk about the aura. There's some intersection between the aura and the Wei Qi field, but the purpose of the Wei Qi field is the same as the purpose of the skin or one of them, which is protection. Our, our uh, immune system starts in the Wei Qi field. And cultivating a strong Wei Qi field, there are many ways to do it, but that is one of the, I guess, goals of our Qigong practice. The next material on this list is muscle. And this is the one in the West that we spend a lot of attention on. Weight training increases the size and the uh, power in our muscles. But the thing to know about muscles from a Qigong perspective is they're very expensive. They use a lot of calories. They use a lot of chi. It's not, ex well, we don't want to use a lot of chi, but using a lot of calories is not actually bad. It means that we can eat more, enjoy more food, and still not have that caloric intake turn into fat in our body. Uh, the uh, But... And Qigong, there's not a lot of focus on building muscle. It's not thought to be the really the place of our strength. What is the place of our strength are tendons and ligaments. The material in the texts, it just refers to tendon. But just in your mind, know that it's talking about material. It doesn't matter where the attachments are, muscle to muscle, muscle to bone, bone to bone. This tendon material is very slow to heal. It's very strong, so it's also not that easy to, to injure. 
but it is also inexpensive. It doesn't require a lot of blood, calories, or chi to be very strong and resilient. And unlike muscle, it doesn't go through this transformation as we get older. So it's very uh, challenging to keep muscle as muscle as you get to an advanced age. It wants to change to fat or to waste away. Tendons, however, once they're cultivated, usually uh, talk about growing your tendons, it's very easy to keep that strength, even when you're quite old. So you see the videos on YouTube of these tiny little rickety old men who can you know, throw a young man. Probably fake, but some of them are not. And if they're not, the reason is he's got good tendons that he's cultivated over time. The other material that we'll work with uh, in this series is bone. And one of the ways we'll work with it is through, I guess, refining our experience of the structure that we take or we make with our bones. And uh, we will also do something called bone breathing later in the series. We don't have time to learn that tonight, but uh, the bones are not what we think they are. They are porous and alive, and they, even though they are also slow to change when we work with them, they are responsive, and they're essential. Like our whole blood system depends on our bones. And then these off to the side are ones we're not going to do a lot of direct work with, the organs and the blood or fluids of the body. That said, uh, when we work with the tendons and the muscles and the other uh, movements of the body, we are moving our blood and lymph and the fluids, and we are caring for our organs also. So I think... Uh, in the various curriculums I teach, there's always a focus and things we're setting off to the side, but just keep in mind, we're not shutting those off. It just means the work we're doing, the things we're setting to the side will benefit indirectly as opposed to directly. So I shifted a couple things since the last time I taught this last spring. I do want to uh, keep Tugunashin. So we did a very, I think of it as a delicate version of Tugunashin last time. This is gonna be the stronger, more young, about purging, especially our lungs. Um, and we will start with shaking. Tonight, it's just gonna be an intuitive shaking. We're not going to spend an inordinate amount of time and then this is a new one for most of you called opening the three gates. So the first two of these three are about purging. And another major concept in Chinese medicine and Qigong is we have to do certain things in general. And we can do these certain things in a variety of ways. First thing we need to do is purge. We're purging old, stagnant sticky energy, uh, energy that might end up staying in a disadvantageous place and becoming an obstruction. Our chi needs to flow, so we need to purge to keep it flowing. And the remainder of our practices were, are going to be centered on iron shirt qigong. So iron shirt qigong is... Uh, has its root in martial arts, and it came about uh, came by that name quite literally. And the martial artists wanted to have an iron shirt; they wanted to be able to go and have someone, you know, get into trouble with somebody, and they would hit them or otherwise attack them. And this iron shirt of energy and strength would protect them, protect their organs and their bones and the other materials of the body. We don't have to 
cultivate it to that extent. I hope you don't. Uh, but these, however, I think there's eight of them. These eight exercises or eight Qigong build up your immune system. So your iron shirt is a protection against viruses, fatigue, um, even on the chi body, the state of being drained energetically, and the protects against the possibility or perhaps the inclination toward imbalance, dysfunction, and so forth. The trick, I think, in teaching and practicing Iron Shirt is there is stillness in these postures. We take a posture and over the, uh, I'll give you hints, you know, we're going to rough draft these postures tonight. And then over time, we refine these postures. And this is, yes, over seven weeks. It's also over however many years you practice Iron Shirt. You keep refining the posture. That means observing, hearing what your body is telling you and responding by modifying very softly, usually, your structure. Since there is stillness, likely there will be tension. And so along with the iron shirt, we're going to do things that will help us release tension that we have gathered holding the posture, that we have gathered in the learning process. I think when we're learning anything that's uh, not full motion, we, we get tense. And a lot of times we don't notice. So along with these, and tonight we'll do each one and um, one more. I haven't decided whether it'll be the phoenix or the turtle. And then along with the strengthening, is healing and resting. So Qigong self-massage is uh, wonderful. It is not, I want to say, you don't have to be a massage therapist to give yourself great Qigong massage. And there are even little mnemonics that help us remember which is which. Um, we will do that after we hold the postures. You can do that in the morning when you get up, before you go to bed, and you just move through them all and end up feeling uh, relaxed. You've released the tension through this very simple process. And uh, the self-acupressure, we're going to learn a collection of acupressure points that we can do on ourselves, and any of those you can also do on friends. And I will. Some of them are tricky to reach and still be relaxed. So keep that in mind. These are not um, dangerous points. So if you mess it up, what will happen is nothing will happen. So don't, don't worry at all about that. And then we'll do learn a Qigong called dredging and purging, which deals with our energy at the level of the meridians in the body. So on both of those, simple practices, you will be able to clear your energy body and prevent or clear obstructions that may be developing. And along with all of these things, we're going to keep an eye on sleeping, resting. The first moment of that attention is simply observing what is the nature of your relationship to sleep. Um, do you sleep just to work and produce? Is sleep precious? Is it sacred? What's your relationship to dreaming? We won't do the dream practice in this class, but I can very briefly relay the steps of dream practice that then you can do on your own. The Taoist dream practice is much... Uh, I want to say simpler, maybe kinder than the Buddhist dream practice. And uh, yeah, it's just about improving your relationship 
improving your ability to remember, but staying on a very friendly level with your dreaming self. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so let's stand up. So now we get to stand well before we sat well. And this is not just, uh, I guess, empty words. There's a specific structure to standing well. And one, we start with our feet and look down. Are they parallel? So you want to be able to stand with parallel feet without feeling tension in your knees. If you have a wide set stance, you may feel like your knees are being twisted or pulled inward. Modify it. Don't be rigid about, oh, must be parallel. We're working toward parallel stance. Main thing is feet under knees. Knees are strong and comfortable. Hips over knees, also strong and comfortable. Then we exhale and simply very subtly roll our hips. Subtle. We want our tailbone to point to the earth. Abdomen is still gently engaged. Of course, shoulders and arms are relaxed, that tucking of the chin. Now you may feel more clearly that your heart is forward. So let's inhale into our heart and exhale. Settle it down. One more time. Good. Close your eyes and allow this posture, which may be exactly how you stand all the time, or you may have made changes. Allow it to imprint. And just to warm and sort of start to shake up any stagnant energy, just shake. However, you start doing that. I don't want you to think about it. I want you to do it. And after shaking intuitively for a breath or two, just peruse your body. Is there any part of you that you're holding still that you're not wanting to shake or that is not wanting to shake? Not necessarily a decision by you. Invite it to join. If it wants to be still, if it wants to stay protected from this jingling vibration movement, probably has a good reason, so don't force it. Good. Just Bring the intention of gently breaking up any ice or things that might be tucked into corners, loosening them up. And then we want to not just loosen and leave them where they are. We want to send them to the earth. They're stuck because they're not being useful for us now. Doesn't mean the earth can't use them. So inhale and then send down with this seed syllable huang, mouth closed. <clears throat> Shake some more. <clears throat> A couple more times. Just make room in your body for things to flow. <clears throat> One more time. <clears throat> and then slowly quiet your shaking. Don't be abrupt. Make it smaller and smaller. Good. Stay with your body.
Much of Qigong is subtle or gentle. So observe after every piece of your practice and don't have this expectation of Hollywood entertainment. It's really the observation is to allow space for your body to observe and enjoy. The ego mind is demanding when it comes to change and well, entertainment. So let's do Tugu Nashin. Tugu Nashin directly translated means uh, in with the new and out with the old. The actual translation is kick out death, take in life. Uh, be that as it may, we're going to take in fresh chi and expel uh, chi that we no longer need. The first part of it is a breath in three parts. Belly, solar plexus, and chest. So this articulation of the body movement and the breath, there might be a learning curve, just do the best you can. But inhale first into your belly, plexus, and chest. And then exhale from chest, from plexus, from belly. Do that a couple more times at your own cadence. The speed and or uh, depth, the bigness of the breath is not as important to me as articulating. So this is the breath we're gonna use throughout. I may or may not remind you, belly, plexus, chest, chest, plexus, belly. Because we're also going to be sending vibration into our body. This is very lung focused. Uh, yes, we want to purge from our whole body, but with Pollution, toxins, phlegm, moisture, dryness, the lungs deserve special attention. So the first is tapping. This is with the fingertips. Let's go ahead and give that a try. And then bring in the breath. And sound as you exhale. Ah. And women, do not tap on your breast tissue. It's, uh, it's not going to give you a vibration into the body, and the tissue usually doesn't like it. Ah. Ah. Good. The next is patting. So in. Exhale. We'll put this all together in a minute. And the last element is an exhale that's almost like a cough, but through pursed lips. So fill your lungs. And then. <laughs> so it looks like I'm trying to blow out a candle, but it's coming from here. This is what we want. Try it again. So with the tapping, that vibration loosens, but the padding really knocks stuff off the walls. And then the f starts to bring it up and out. So putting it together, we're going to inhale, tap, hold our breath, pat, and then you can keep patting. But the main thing is the exhale is that f ready. Hold, pat. You keep patting or stop, but we're going to do this several times. If you start to get lightheaded, just pause until your blood oxygen uh, normalizes. 
bellies, plexus, just hold. Inhale, tap. Hold and pat. And let's do one more time. Tap. Pat. Rest. Stay with your body. Just observe. Any questions about that? Okay. And before we start taking quiet, positions, postures, one more movement. It's called opening the three gates. So the three gates are aligned with our three dantian, which are somewhat aligned with certain chakras. So the lower dantian is just below the navel inside the body. This is the main one we work with in Qigong because this is where we can store qi. The middle dantian is aligned with the heart uh, center, heart chakra. And the upper dantian is in the skull, in the center of the brain. So the gates, you can think of them as gates to these dantian, because all three dantians are in the body. That separates them from the chakras, which are in and often projecting outward. Very simple idea is, you have a gate in front and a gate in back. So it's the navel in the front for the lower gate. And at the level of your waist on your spine, those who know the word, it's Ming Men for the lower gate. In front for the middle, it's the heart center and the center between the scapula. And the um, upper gates, uh, well, the upper gates, third eye and jade pillow. So opening and closing, it's physical movement. It's more energetic with the upper body, upper gait, but that's where we'll start. Simple. And there are three kind of intensities or levels to how you open and close the gates. We always start with the gentlest, especially anyone who has neck issues or um, upper spine issues. And it's deceptively simple. You drop your chin, touch it to your collarbone if you can, and you're opening the back gate, the back upper gate. You look up and you're opening the front upper gate, which closes the back. So this is often true of the body. What's open on the front closes in back and vice versa. And be sure to apply the 60% guide. So I could probably move my head back further. Why would I want to do that? It's opening and closing. It seems so, well, unexotic. But as I do this, I'm working with my vagus nerve. I'm working with my cerebral spinal fluids, my lymph, my blood to the brain. And if you do this for a little while and you, you know, it's recommended that you do these, especially the gentler ones for quite a few repetitions, you will notice you start creating saliva. So you're also working with your salivary glands. Just simple movement that does so much. So the middle, so we, 
we've done the upper, we pause the upper. Working with the middle, very simple. Little bee cans, park them right here. This is actually long to center. And we simply open our chest, can bring our elbows back and close our chest by bringing our elbows forward. So worry about how much it's easier to think about where your elbows are. They will move your middle gate, open and front and closed and back, open and back and closed and front. Also, moving that length. This, just sitting here and moving without really bringing attention, you're working with lung two, which is the kind of the first or the closest to the actual lungs, the meridian point. It's on an energy level, you're helping your lungs. You're pumping, right? All of these are about pumping. Our heart is always pumping. If if you, I would recommend sort of as homework, getting in touch with your heartbeat. And maybe each beat is a little fast. So every other beat. And your body pump is connecting with your heart pump. So we will be circling back to other practices and other aspects of practices that create pumps. What we don't want to have in our body are obstacles and obstructions because it interferes with the flow. What we do want to have is experiences of pumping because our physical movements are aiding and doing kind of the work for our energy body and the fluids in our physical body, moving them. It's very simple, right? Pause and observe. And then the lower dantian, the same idea. You're basically bending back, pushing your hips forward to open this gate and then bending forward and bringing intention to open the area at the level of your waist. So you could bend forward like this, we don't want that, at the waist. And if you have lower back pain, this can be as subtle as one inch, one inch. Keep doing that while I let this cat out. So we'll go to the second intensity. There is a third, but it's just exactly what we've done and trying to move larger. And I, I think for most of us, may not even be necessary to go to that larger movement. Um, yeah. So then returning to your upper gate. Go down and feel the weight of your head. I'm not even saying push, just feel how heavy your head is and feel how open the back of your neck and jade pillow, this part of your skull is. Come back upright and then feel the weight of your head. And with this stronger guess it's a pull, you want to make sure you stay aware. Your awareness stays with your head. And if you have ever had any neck cramping or issues, pause upright before you go one way or the other. And rest.
and then for the middle gate, um, we have straight arms. And to open the back, we bring our arms across. Feel the opening between your scapula. And then open your heart center. Still moving slowly. This isn't about swinging and getting larger movements. Keep going. And down. Observe. And the lower gate. Okay. Same movement. You can even put your hands on your hips to kind of Get, uh, get a sense of how deep you are moving. Just press forward. Looks like I'm bending back. I'm not. I'm pushing my hips. Forward. And then push your rear and your lumbar out. So I'm not bending forward. I'm pushing my back out. Back and forth. So the, this isn't where we're headed to practice this. You go through, in, if um, you didn't go through the smallest, medium, largest every time, but you should open and close each level and then bring them into a kind of cadence. So chin down, chin up. I'll put my fingers here. Close front, close back. Um, and a close front, lower, close front, back. And then you can go back up, close. So you're basically doing this weaving back and forth. That's one way, so I'm getting double, my heart center is getting double attention. If you wanna be more um, even about it, or if the heart center is saying, stop it, you can go, I'll start from the bottom, close front, close back, close front, close back, close front, and back, and go down again. The reason I like the first way is it feels a little more fluid. And what we want to end up doing, if you now do these movements and pay attention to your spine, you're doing this with your spine. And if I go back to start at the bottom each time, there's less of that fluid, snaky movement. And rest. Stay. Friday 
Good. Any questions about that? Anybody have any freaky pains anywhere? Um, okay. I'm yeah. curious to see a side view of the lower uh, gate opening and closing, if you wouldn't mind, please. Sure. Lower gate. So, um, let's see, pull in this. You can watch my hands as well. So I'm pushing, I don't know if it's really that helpful, but pushing this part out. So if I were hinging from my hips, I would be doing this, but I'm pushing out and then pushing out. There's not as much backward flex, flexing, at least not for me. I always think, Thinking about the Ming men and the navel, correct? Yes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. But I end up moving from here to here, to be honest. I can't stabilize my hips completely and move from my waist. Any other questions? Okay. So the first one we're going to play with is each one and uh, also called embracing the tree or your tree. And it is kind of the royal posture of standing meditation in uh, Taoism and Chinese medicine. So tonight, we're just going to kind of rough draft it if you haven't done this before. And if you have, you have the additional opportunity to work on your each one. This is where we, um, well, I don't want to start the sentence that way. There are many approaches to each one. There's the martial approach where the posture is actually very deep in the horse stance, but the uh, version I use and I teach is a little more soft and higher and um, more given to most people to hold it longer. So here you just see this uh, circle around the front and back is actually a path of the microcosmic orbit. We're not going to do that today. Uh, what I want to work with is once you stand to be able to go through your body and refine your standing posture. Stay there until it's usually your muscles start to complain and then see how you can very subtly refine your posture to take into consideration the information your body is giving you while still maintaining the each one posture. And then after we spend time with that, we're going to uh, modify the arms a little bit and stay standing, but use the imagery of standing in water and see how that affects our experience. Yeah, let's just do that and then I'll talk about um, the other couple of postures we may do separately. So we start out the same way, standing well. Watch your feet hip width apart or shoulder width apart, depending on your build. And now uh, sink. So your knees bend and look down and see where your knees are in relation to your toes. The instruction is often knees should be over your feet. Let's get a little more detail. We want the center of our patella over the space between our large toe and our second toe. So where you would wear uh, flip flops. So if like in my case, I'm over my third toe, go ahead and give up that parallel foot posture and 
the front of your feet only, a little bit. That is probably the safest and or strongest relation, knee to feet. Then we want to, again, shift. Not really, it's almost sink your tailbone is a better way to say. And your tailbone, for now, let's just keep the tailbone, the hips, where they feel strongest. And we'll challenge that in a bit. Shoulders over your hips. Abdomen is engaged. Your chin is slightly tucked. And let's not worry about the arms yet. Feel the structure of your bones. Now, you can rise a little bit or sink a little bit. In, this, in any standing posture, your quadriceps are going to be working. So quadriceps, just accept. You have to work. The rest of your body, if you're in a decently structured posture, should not have to work so much. And then as we inhale, we bring our arms up. So in the version that I've taught, I've been taught, I teach and I use, the shoulders are highest. And of course the shoulders are relaxed and down. The wrists are next highest. So here's my shoulder, here's my wrist and my elbow. It's naturalistic. Some people, especially in Tai Chi schools, sink the elbow quite a bit, but we want to be gentle about that so we can have our armpits open. And you can kind of do this wobbliness to find your strength, if that's helpful. The hands, not like this, not like this, shake them. And that's your natural hand, relaxed hand position, hand posture. The last element of the arms is you're holding a pretty big ball, like a beach ball, maybe a big beach ball. And you want that roundness. <clears throat> if you can maintain that roundness, none of your joints are going to be uh, squeezed, which cuts off chi flow. Now let's go through and add some details. Instead of just saying your shoulders are down, I want you to slide your scapula up your back and then slide them back down. That's a little more helpful than just drop your shoulders, slide them down. Tongue is on upper palate. Lift your toes and grasp the floor, opening the soles of your feet. Now there are energy centers that relate to each other that are a little surprising. The uh, bubbling spring and the soles of your feet influence, reflect, echo your perineum. So as you are standing, pull your arches up and see if you can feel something happen in your perineum. And then let them relax, drop your arches, pull them up. So what we want to happen is a little bit more closure. We're not squeezing. But that perineum, this is actually energetically open posture. We don't want to have our perineum splayed open. I can say that about a perineum. So the toes are holding the floor. The arch is up. Now try to maintain that connection and use less muscle.
Now we're going to hold this posture. Unless you have balance issues, you're free to close your eyes. I would recommend it simply because it's easier to stay <clears throat> uh, more deeply into your body without vision information flowing in. If your biceps, triceps, quadriceps are telling you that, or will tell you that they are uncomfortable, you can talk to them. It's actually quite effective. You can inhale and exhale into them, or you can slightly and change your structure to see if maybe it your structure needs changing. You absolutely must release the structure, go right back in. It's a very detrimental message to send to your body that you give up. That's 30 more seconds. There's a variety of ways of releasing your posture. Today, since it's springtime, let's open and draw in that wood element energy, that burgeoning spring energy into our body three times. And then you can also open it outward. So since we're going to go right back into standing, let's just shake. You shake your arms and bounce on your heels. Flick your hands and kick your feet. Good. And notice. Uh, we didn't really hold it that long. Uh, I think it was about three minutes, two and a half minutes. So in order to pass the test to teach this, I had to hold it for 45 minutes. You get to work up to that. I'd say 10 minutes is an, is an excellent held posture practice. So I did not give you any instruction or guidance beyond you know, addressing any aches and pains, but what we hold in our mind 
is just as important as how we hold our body. Uh, many different meditations can be done held in that uh, standing meditation posture. This one I want to give you, which is from a different lineage, but I think it's quite helpful and beautiful, really. Uh, you can do it, returning to holding the ball structure. You can also uh, hold your arms like this. Just make sure that your shoulder blades drip down your back and your armpits remain open. This to me, I can better feel being held by Will. So the image, the details are up to you. You can imagine yourself submerged and even your head is being held by water. Or you can be up to your chest, up to your neck. I think you need to be at least to this height. But gently, quickly, look at your feet and knees. I didn't move mine, so uh, not a lot of change needed. Sink your tailbone. Settle your heart and roll your head so crown points to heaven. And then settle into the posture and visualize standing as if you're in water. Now, water that is absolutely still will become spoiled, will become fetid, right? So even though we're in a still structure, posture, I want you to feel moved by the water. We're not in the ocean. It's a very calm pond, bath, lake but it's alive. And stay. One more minute. Trust that even though your main focus isn't on the water, that you will still be held by it. I'd like you to try one more thing. With each inhale, hopefully gentle, natural, raise the arches of your feet. 
exhale, relax. Inhale, your arches come up. Exhale, relax. And with each gentle inhale and rising of your arches, you're pulling up yin, earth, chi, earth energy. With your exhale, you're allowing any of that energy that wants to, that your body isn't absorbing, to tumble back to the earth. Inhale up and exhale back. And if your perineum starts to open and close, that's fine. Beautiful, relax your feet open, circle, exhale down. Shake your arms, bounce on your heels, shake your hands out and kick Good. I want to show you a picture before we, I think, well, I think we're gonna do the Phoenix. So this was the other one I was thinking about. which is probably the most physically challenging, but is so good for your kidneys. Um, however, maybe I don't have a picture. Okay. Oh, you just have to use me. I'll have them by next week. The phoenix cleans her feathers or its feathers. And sometimes the golden phoenix cleans its feathers because in Qigong, apparently everything is golden. Yay. It brings in other ideas and other ways of caring for ourselves. So you're basically, it's not quite purging, it's cleaning. So purging, we're just kind of Okay, let's get it out, let's get it out. Cleaning will clear out things that are a little more long-term, a little more entrenched. And for this, we use our breath in a little more mm, yang manner. So for this practice, we need to have a wide stance because grounding is essential. And the wider we go, the easier it is to ground. So my feet are about three feet apart. You can go all the way down if you're young and need that help to focus your grounding. But uh, I'll tell you the steps and then we'll do it together. Tell you and show you. So I've got this wide stance and my upper body posture looks like this. This is where my navel is. My hands must be below my Don Tian. My palms are open to the earth. And we do a kaplabhati, but because we're standing, it's exhale only. So kaplabhati often looks like <laughs> we don't want to do that. We take in air to begin, and then it's like exhale. And we relax, air comes in. Exhale. So when we're exhaling, we're creating a vacuum here. And those of you who've worked with me before or have 
done Qigong elsewhere. I will tell you what that is so that you can employ that. But if you haven't, just work on the exhale. As we exhale, we pull our perineum up, we pull our abdomen in, we pull our kidneys in and our diaphragm down. So from all directions on our Dantian, this place that holds our life force energy, we're going, we relax, it opens, chi rushes in, fresh chi. We're fueling ourselves to clean. We would never sit around doing the kaplabhati in Qigong. To take in chi just because you want it is counter to the whole kind of worldview. So to fuel, and then we take a third of our breath very strongly. And I imagine I have this connection and I'm gonna scrape upward with the next third. And I've just cleared any gunk from that part of my body. And then, and then I'm going to release it. So I go, So I've cleaned myself vertically. Now I'm going to clean myself horizontally. And it's as if I'm an octopus that I'm doing this from all around me, but I only have two hands, but I go, and it's like I've cleaned this outer ring of my Wei Chi field. And then again, and then I'm nice and clean. I want to connect my perineum my lower dantian all the way up. I do this by using hot jing chi, which if that makes no sense, set it aside. But I want to visualize up through my spine and out my tongue. My hands are like this. So it's This happens to be one of my favorites. But so as we uh, exhale to get rid of, we're going to do this three times so that we can do all six healing sounds. And it goes. Excuse through. me. Yeah. Excuse me. Are we are, are we exhaling always through our mouth? Uh, well, we're going to be making sounds. So in this case, yes, as we make the sound, we'll exhale through our mouths. But uh, there's another way to do it. And without sound, you would use your nose. Generally speaking, you want to be very careful exhaling through your mouth. The guidance is you can release chi that you need when you. <sighs> so they would disagree with a lot of Western uh, exercise, which have you inhale and exhale out the mouth. Did that answer? I think it did. Okay. So find your best stance, go deep, and then uh, shift your pelvis. If you're so deep that it's you can't shift your pelvis and you're leaning forward, you're too deep. It's about structure, not depth. Here. Connect those palms to the earth. Take in. Fill your lungs, more or less. Exhale, all the way. One third inhale. Second. Third. And the first sound is shh, F-H. Inhale, one third. And then from the bottom of your torso out through your tongue. Eyes look up as you do it. We're going to move straight through. Uh, if you get lightheaded, just pause. Fill your lungs.
uh, sh. Rest down back into stance for the last one. Inhale. Like a guttural tiger growl is what it's called. And now step and brush, step, kick and brush is good. Good. Check my tongue. Wonderful. Any questions about the phoenix cleans its feathers? So there are details, a little more information on what's actually happening when you go up the spine, but you know, that's a good first introduction, I think. And I like to include it because it shows us, at least in theory, the difference between purging and cleansing or cleaning. Both are necessary. Purging is essential. Clean cleaning is like a, a more intermediate self-care, you would say. But it's still quite possible in the beginning. So we have purged, we've taken energy in, these stillness postures, even though it may not be front of mind, refine our chi, refine the chi that we take in through breath and through our practice to be more aligned with our, could call it our frequency or vibration so that we can use it. If you think about uh, food, a beautiful apple, but you can't like cram an apple into your muscles or your body, you have to take it in, it has to be transformed and digested. We have to do that with energy too, and there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. But being quiet and standing and observant is one way. So let's do some Qigong self-massage. You can do this after any practice, you can do it any time. The first uh, kind of memory guide is move, massage, meditate. So the meditation is really just the pausing and observing that we've been doing. But we move an area of the body. We massage it in five different ways. And then we stay quiet and meditate on it. Let's start with the top of the body. Uh, and we'll see how far we get. This can take as long as 30 minutes, or if you really move fast, maybe 10. So the first part, we go back to our neck. So yes, we can open and close our gates, but also look to one side and the other side. And I'm just doing each of these movements maybe three times. And then we circle a half circle in front. I've never been that fond with circling around the back. Um, I think it's dangerous and we don't really want to be that flexible to the back. So now that I have moved my neck, I want to massage it. Five different ways to massage. The first is to brush. And this is the level of the skin. They so basically like I don't know if you, you have too much water on your arms, you would brush it off, maybe brush off dust. So it's really quite gentle. And even though you're not going deep, you're stimulating your skin, right? The next is the level of the muscle. 
And for that, I'll demonstrate on my arm. It's a little easier to see. We leave our thumb out, we grasp, and mostly with the pads of the ends of our fingers and release, a little pull. But it's really the grasping that's doing the most. And it should feel good. So the neck, there's that lot of muscle here and there's not a lot right over the bones. So you wanna stay on the side, but you can go above and below. So even though we're isolating the areas Reminding that in Taoism, everything's connected. So you don't stay right at the neck. So you can even do this little bit if it feels like a good idea. Excuse me, but it's really those traps leading up to the neck can use that. Then the next is pressing to the level of the bone. So in the area you're paying attention to, you find the bone in the neck, uh, you know, it's an obvious choice of the spinal, cervical spine. So basically for this, all four fingers are together supporting each other and the bone, let's see, my arm bone is exposed. You press and it's like your fingers have a little hook so they're not straight. I'm trying to get the angle, there it is this little hook, and you grasp and press. And the way it makes sense to me is then I exhale and I sink into my bone. Bones are quiet. They're also slow. So if we had all the time in the world, we would spend the most time with this level. So fingers, all four fingers, the thumbs are resting. And then exhale. And just inch your way up the back of your neck. So we're not doing the head. We could do the head. But I want you to basically want to first focus on the areas that might have retained tension from what we did. Then is polish. So tricky on the neck. Let's see. I'll show you on my arm again. So it's different. This is brushing, but this is polishing. More circular, and you're really trying to get some warmth going. You want to warm up that area. Reminding that when we warm our body with our lao gong in our own hands, it's different than a heating pad or the sun. And once And you can, uh, you're working on the side, help yourself out by pressing your elbow up so you can get a little deeper, a little further back. And the last is patting. So this is called dispersing. It's not really with a different material of the body so much as we're dispersing that warmth and that chi. All of these should feel good. If it doesn't feel good, the teacher ta taught me this, said, then it's your fault. You should fix it. <laughs> so then onto the shoulders. Um, so brushing shoulders. I'm running out of time. And let's, let's do the shoulder all the way down the arm because uh, normally we would separate it, but at least then we'll have our shoulders and our arms. And then grasping and releasing. And all the way around. So don't forget the underside of your triceps. And wherever you have meat, there's no reason to do this where it's bone. And then the shoulders. Good. And then the bone. So I find these bones right on the edges of my shoulders, which you may or may not have access to, it depends on your musculature, are uh, very receptive. 
So inhale, exhale, shake. And then warm. Bow. And you will find parts of your arm, parts, different parts of your body are different temperatures. If there's any part that's cold, when you do this over your whole body, spend more time there to warm it up. Good. And patting. Dispersing. Another bone that's good is the collar. And rest, meditate. So uh, if you have time after our class can keep going. When you get to your abdomen, you're dealing more with your organs than muscle and bone, but they like to be padded, grasped and released. Just work your way down your legs and you will have a nice sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. You're very welcome. This was lovely. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great week. Bye. <laughs>